Uh, my name is Lindsay Bransko. I am a web developer, designer, and um, I own a design and marketing company in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, we specialize in WordPress and also e-commerce. Uh, we do uh, both e-commerce with WordPress and e-commerce uh, standalone projects, as well as working on our own open source e-commerce project. Um, so today I decided uh, that I was going to do a talk on e-commerce because it's probably one of the most complex and most frustrating things that any web developer uh, is going to come across in, in kind of like the basic like, client realm of things. Um, so I wanted to kind of address the issues that people have with e-commerce, which almost always re revolve around uh, planning. Um, most of the times when I encounter clients who have had a failed e-commerce project or a developer who's kind of stuck in the middle and doesn't know where to go, it's because they missed a bunch of really key stages when they were planning with the client and didn't think ahead um, in the way that they should and instead thought of it more like a content management system than they did a full e-commerce platform. Um, with content management, you have you know, the basic content and users. With e-commerce, you've got products, content, users, orders, inventory, everything. Um, and to compound that, you've got issues with uh, confusing documentation, misleading uh, features, and there's not very many features out there. Um, so if you know what you're going into, at least you can kind of eliminate one of those major issues. Um, when you have a lack of planning, you wind up with a very scary creature called the scope creep, and you end up at the end of the project feeling like you've done way more work and you didn't get paid enough for it. Um, so that's why we're going to kind of avoid that. Um, when, you, when you jump into an e-commerce project, you pretty much have everything there you need. You just need to work out how to arrange it, how to get everything in its nice little boxes that it needs to be in so that you can start building out your database, organizing the back end, and making it a really solid interface for the client to use. Because when you're working with e-commerce, the clients really have to be comfortable in the, in the dashboard and the administration because they're going to be in it more than anybody else. So a lot of the questions that you're going to have to ask yourself, or yourself and the client, is, you know, what the store is about, what the products are, you know, figure out what their long-term plan is for the store, and then educate the client as to whether or not their their expectations are realistic, whether or not their expectations are too low, too high, and what they can do with them. Um, so we're going to go through how how we do that. Um, the number one thing is focusing the client's expectations. You want to make sure that they're focused on the important part, which is their products, how they're going to generate, how they're going to display their products, and how they're going to turn those into orders. A lot of times clients are thinking big picture, social media, all of this other stuff, but if you don't pin down these very important things that I have listed, um, you know, colors and sizes of products, where does it ship from, what's the business address, you know, what are, are there any special requirements. Um, a lot of clients don't think that their products are, are special requirement products until you really get into the idea of like what it is. A simple t-shirt could be a very complex thing to sell if you're selling one type of t-shirt and it comes in six different colors and two different sizes and maybe also men's and large and you want to kind of create a product grid versus individual products. Um, so things can be more complex than they, than they appear. Um, aside from products, you want to kind of get an idea of what kind of services the clients want to offer. Um, sometimes it's a client that wants to deal with um, things such as like product, like discount grouping, uh, customer groups, if they do wholesale and retail. Um, these are types of things where a client just thinks like, oh, it's just a coupon code, I don't have to, it, it's not important, but it's definitely a huge, huge uh, glitch if you don't plan for that ahead. Um, other things like uh, wish lists, bridal registries, um, uh, subscriptions versus single purchase products, all of that kind of stuff.
So to just overview, we want to make sure that we know what the client has to sell, what they want to provide, and what they're capable of providing. Um, and then once you have those kind of bases down, you can start building out your plan for the store, building out your database, and trying to figure out what your back end is going to look like. So as I talked about, we've got different products, have different kinds of requirements. They're all going to interact and kind of work in the database differently, depending on the type of product, uh, subscriptions, uh, variable products, simple products, all of that stuff is going to work. A little bit differently. So really what we have are two kind of basic types. Those are the two I'm going to cover anyways. The other ones um, would be digital. But they all kind of work under this kind of basic structure. We've got real products, which are the actual physical products, the ones that they're going to count inventory for. Um, that would be the small shirt, the medium shirt, the large shirt, the extra large shirt. But then you have something called a container, or what I call a container product. Um, the container product would be the t-shirt. So you sell a t-shirt in small, medium, large. Uh, the t-shirt's not an actual product. You don't count inventory for it. You don't ship it. You ship the medium t-shirt. Um, once you kind of wrap your head around this idea, it makes everything else a lot easier. <laughs> so. When you're setting up products, you know, if you have just a regular real product, you're selling a single garden gnome, then you're pretty much, that's it. You don't really have to worry about it. But when you're working with variable products, you have to kind of look at the overview of what that product is, what types of variations there are, and then figure out which kind of method you're going to use to kind of interact the products with itself and with the variables. Um, the first method, um, we're going to set up a variation of the product as a container product. So that means that if you're selling t-shirts and they come in blue, green, and red, and then the blue, green, and red come in small, medium, large, instead of just having a t-shirt as a product, you're going to have the blue t-shirt as a product, and then the small, medium, large will be variables. That's kind of the simplest way to deal with these types of things. Um, it, there are clients where this doesn't work for them. If they want something where they have kind of a simplistic store and they want people to just see one product, it's got the same description, it's got the same everything except for color and size, then um, the next method would work, which is more of a, a grid of sorts. You're going to work on almost nest, nested uh, variables or an array of variables. So you've got your one product, which is the t-shirt, and uh, you would have a small blue, small red, small green, large blue, large red, large green. Usually these are represented in like a grid, um, and the client can kind of choose which one or, or quantities of which ones, um, or they're just kind of a, a nested uh, select list. Um, so once, as I talked about before, <laughs> We've got, it, it, it's really a domino effect because once you start kind of, once you start working out how you're going to work out the single products, the variable products, you've got to assign inventory, you've got to assign shipping, um, all of these things, discounts, they're all going to be related to either the container product or they're going to be related to the variable product. If you're tracking, um, Shipping weights and the weights between variables change. A small t-shirt is lighter than a large t-shirt. You want to make sure that you're set up in a, your system, your cart that you choose, is set up in a way where the variables can be tracked. Um, there's definitely carts, uh, especially with uh, WordPress, that don't do a lot of the nested variables. you got to make sure that if that's the route you're going, check the features, make sure that they're available. Um, and keep in mind that discounts that can only be related to the product, which we would call the container product, can't be related to the small blue t-shirt. They're only going to be related to all t-shirts. Um, so when you're planning that out, it's really important to keep that in mind and kind of just plan ahead for that. Um, know that it's, it, it is definitely a big, a big issue that comes up. So when we talk about shipping products, 
there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, a lot of stores that I work with just use a kind of flat rate, uh, $10 shipping fee. If it's a store that has wide um, weights, uh, from I have one client that has a two ounce product and a hundred pound product. Uh, flat shipping does not work for those. Um, you want to know what those are going to be ahead of time. Ask them, kind of pull it, pull it out of them. A lot of times they don't, they just don't think about it. You got to know. Uh, you really have to know what to ask when you're in these situations with a client. Um, the options that we generally have would be flat rate shipping, which would literally be one flat rate, no matter how many products you put in the cart. Um, shipping provider API which is going to actually allow you to directly connect to the live feed of those products. So for instance, UPS, FedEx, they all have APIs that you can connect directly to. Um, they use the weights that are associated in your cart or in, in, your, in your inventory and the addresses from the client to the customer and calculate it and show it in real time, which is really cool. Um, but that doesn't always work for a lot of clients. Um, the other option is weight-based. Um, this allows you to create a really complex, really uh, detailed kind of detailed grid of what your weights are going to be and how you're going to deal with them as far as doing shipping. You could do, you know, zero to one pounds is this much money. Uh, 1.2 pounds, 3 pounds is going to be this much to cost. And you can really, if if your client is going to use a lot of different carriers or they want to kind of, they want to mark up the shipping or anything like that, then the table, the table based um, on weight is a really good route to go. Uh, the issue with that is it's extremely intensive and time consuming to go through, get the average of all of the available shipping options that they're going to use and figure out the increments in which you know it's going to go up. Um, you can also ship based on price. The more expensive the item, the more you can charge, or the more expensive the item, the less you can charge, um, or a combination of all of the above. The combination of all of the above kind of makes you feel like that. Um, <laughs> so before you code, before you decide which option you're going to go with, you want to get an idea of what the weight ranges are. As I said, you know, the client's just selling products that are always going to be one pound. You can kind of work, you can work with that um, in relation to a table base or a flat rate. If it's zero to 100 pounds, you're going to have issues and you probably want to stay away from that. You want to know what carriers the client approves of or disapproves of. Um, I've had experiences where clients refuse to use UPS or refuse to use uh, the post office or will only use THL. Uh, they all come with different types of connections uh, and APIs that you can access. So you want to know what they can use, what they can't use, and what they won't use uh, beforehand. Um, you want to uh, sorry. <laughs> you want to know if you're going to be combining multiple products into one box or shipping them separately. Especially if you're using the API. When you're using the API, especially um, UPS and FedEx, they calculate the shipping price differently if it's two boxes versus one box. It also calculates it differently based on the size of the box. Um, I have a client who has a drop shipping plant in North Carolina and their location is in Connecticut. Half of their products ship from Connecticut, the other half ship from North Carolina. The ones that ship from North Carolina, um, they are sometimes put in multiple boxes, sometimes put in individual boxes. Sometimes if they order from both, you have to calculate the shipping differently. Uh, these are all things that you really have to keep in mind um, and get an idea of how that's going to work out for your client. If, they, if they're packaging it themselves, for the most part, you can assume that they're always going to put it in one box and you can kind of calculate the weight, the size of the box, and still send that to the, the uh, your shipper's API. If they aren't going to do that, and it's going to be more like my other client who has a very wide weight range and location from shipping, you want to work on the API as well as um, start dealing with uh, additional variables. You want to make sure that you have some way of tagging these products as coming from one location versus the other. Um, where they're shipping from 
could cause a big issue, especially when you're working with uh, existing plugins with WordPress. Uh, not as far as I know right now, um, there aren't any uh, plugins that deal with multiple warehouse locations, which could be an issue. Sometimes at Amazon, if you order a bunch of books, they come from all different locations, and the shipping far exceeds the cost of the books. Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, the client that I was explaining before that has the one ounce product, they're shipping always, if the client, if the customer only orders one or two of those two ounce products, the shipping's uh, $8, and the product is 4 But in my experience in, in, in working with these, it's not always an issue. If the customer wants to buy that product, they're going to buy it regardless of the shipping. It's all um, kind of how you market it and how you, what your competition is doing. That's another important thing to look at uh, with regards to shipping. Um, a lot of people, you know, will get to the checkout and then leave, go to another store, get to the checkout, see what the shipping, you know, rates are, and go back. Uh, so if you can keep an eye on what your, what the um, competition is doing, that's really good. But yeah, we've had experiences where the, the shipping is going to exceed, and it, it most of the time it's not a problem. But if you can get around it and, and kind of work out um, the cost uh, to profit ratio, then you could do that. But yeah, books are a thing that's really hard. And uh, the hundred pound products. Um, it's, with UPS, it's free, if it's a hundred pounds or more, it's freight shipping, so that's very expensive um, versus the actual cost of the item. Uh, it's just it's one of those things that you can't really change <laughs> unless you have um, it, another issue with uh, dealing with APIs is if the client has a um, what do they call it like a like a wholesaler account with UPS or FedEx, they get discounted rates from those shippers. That can be an issue if they want to pass that that discount rate on to their customers. Um, UPS doesn't provide an API for the discounted rates, and you have to kind of go in and build your own. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. You can associate discounts with shipping and weights, and again, if you set up your products um, in a way where the weights are variable based on the actual product instead of the container product, you should be able to work out a discount that's that's relatively close to what UPS uh, what UPS gives you. Um, so when we're working with the provider API, uh, like I explained, you're going to get costs directly from the provider. They're going to be the real-time costs. So we've actually had um, a customer of one of my clients go on our website, do the um, go through the order process but not check out, check the price, then go to UPS.com and check the price to see if we were marking up our UPS prices. And it was off by about 75 cents. Um, it was mostly off because of the box size. Uh, as I explained before, when a bunch of products are put into a box, into one box, the size of the box is going to change or they're going to separate them out so the cost is going to be more. In this case, um, all of the products were shipping separately. So the cost was more versus the client who put, the, put it in and kind of, I guess she guessed the weight, um, but she was 75 cents off. She called up very angry about it and I had to explain to her <laughs> that it, it's close. But there are, it, if you're going to use the API and you're going to present it as though these are real UPS prices, um, you want to try to be as close as possible and again, stress enough, planning the products, the weight of the products, the size, of the shipping containers that are all very important in that. Um, you know, when this doesn't work, again, is if you're going to mark up the costs, um, if the cost of customer is going to be higher than the actual, pro or the cost of shipping is going to be higher to the customer than the actual product, um, if, the, uh, if it's not convenient for the client to ship from those, or, you know, not you, client not wanting to use it. Um, going into detail on the weight base, um, like I said, the cool thing about this is that it can give you really complete granular control over the price of shipping and you can mark up, mark down, do whatever you want. Um, with the shipping, you can do it, um, you, you can make multiple rules in it, so if they want one day, two day, three day, overnight, whatever, you can build those out yourself instead of having to rely on an API and that way you can discount things where you want to, or you can mark up things where you want to. Um, 
a lot of times, you know, marking up shipping is a very common thing in the e-commerce world. Um, in places where it's a low profit, or in retailers where the product is a low profit product, they make their money back on the shipping. So they're going to want to have this granular control to make sure that they can profit on these low profit products that otherwise would, would have cost them money to ship. Um, so it's really, really useful um, in that sense. You really have to have a solid understanding of what the weight ranges are, what the costs are. Um, it's a lot of calculations and, and sitting online, like writing down the com comparisons between the, the services that they might use or the, the most currently used services. A lot of times, again, looking at the competitors, uh, this is a good way to kind of get started with that. If you look at what your competitors are charging for the same product, you can kind of start your table based off of maybe their lowest weight product and work up from there. Um, but you do, I mean, you really need to have a lot of time. <laughs> the client has to give you a lot of time in building that out. Um, it, it doesn't work when uh, you have different costs for items within the same weight range. Um, if you have, like I said, extra large boxes, the weight-based table doesn't rely on the size of the box. So if you're using something like UPS or FedEx and the box sizes are going to change, you can't be as um, realistic with your calculations as you want to be. Because you can't, you can't do that. Um, some of the standalone uh, e-commerce systems allow you to actually put box weight in and it will calculate the, or box size in, and it will actually calculate the size of the box if you combine multiple products. But again, that's still not very realistic. If you have a product that fits in a four inch by four inch box and you put two of them together, it's not necessarily going to require an eight inch by eight inch box. Um, so they're all just, like I said, it, it, like that first picture I showed with the cat and the yarn. <laughs> it's all there, it's just trying to untangle the information in the mess and making it work um, for your client. Uh, again, in my, in my experience, the, every cart I've done has been different for every client. I've almost, unless the clients are selling the same product, I've almost never been able to kind of just reuse a table-based um, shipping or reuse like a, a product markup or anything like that. It's uh, it definitely requires a lot of forethought and a lot of planning. Um, I just wanted to show an example of if you're doing table based. One of the things I've seen in the past with developers who aren't um, comfortable or haven't done uh, e-commerce before is they just charge by the pound. Um, so one pound if one pound equals one dollar, ten pounds equals ten dollars, twenty pounds equals twenty dollars. So you know, you double up as you go. Um, but as you can see here, if you have a 10 pound item is 1247, um, a 20 pound item is only 1503. So if you kind of work off that way and you're trying to build a more simplified weight base, you're gonna have a lot of clients who won't check out at the end because they'll wind up paying a lot more. Between, you know, changes between 10 pounds, 15 pounds don't add a lot unless the distance is far or the size of the box is big. Um, and finally, we have the price base table. Um, same exact thing. Uh, you want to go through all of your prices the same way you would do with your weights of your products. Um, this really only works if you have valuable products that you're shipping. For instance, jewelry. Uh, jewelry is a really kind of outside of the box type of thing to sell when you're dealing with really expensive or valuable things. Um, we we're talking about putting insurance on something or, or dealing with, you know, simply the handling of, of a valuable item is going to cost more, so you can include that in the shipping. Other alternatives, um, if you have items that need insurance or that need uh, additional shipping and handling fees, there's plugins that you can use to add a handling fee separately from the shipping. Um, the issue with that is, again, uh, customers checking out see a handling fee and they get a little, why do I have to pay somebody to handle my product? And, you know, if you build it into the shipping, a lot of times it's just, it's just a cleaner checkout process for the customer. They don't, when you start separating out line items, like shipping, handling, and all of that, you're now making the client, the customer think about those things. Like, I'm being charged for this and this and this. Versus just saying, you know, this is what it costs to ship to you. 
Um, most of the times I wind up using a, a combination of all of the above. Um, this is very difficult to do uh, when you're working with a simplified kind of e-commerce plugin. If you have um, a basic plugin, it's usually one or the other. You can't say this product is going to use the API versus this product is going to use uh, the table base. Um, it, in my experience and, and uh, the last time I've looked, it's, there hasn't been a direct plugin, but you can definitely uh, code for it. The great thing about as you guys know, WordPress is that it's very open. You can kind of code for anything you want to, as long as you have the, the time and the ability to do so. Um, but you need to know that you need to do that in advance. If you don't have this structure down, you're not going to know that you need to do this until you get to the end and the clients, you know, I won't use UPS, but I need to use for that. <laughs> so the next thing that becomes a big headache um, kind of along the same lines as shipping is the taxes. Um, it's another big kind of stumbling point for people who are building e-commerce sites. A lot of people have the false assumption that buying on the internet is tax free. It's not. Um, you have to pay or you have to charge sales tax for any locate any place that you have an actual business location um, or a registered business. So my client who has a drop shipping warehouse in, um, in North Carolina and his uh, personal shipping warehouse in Connecticut has to now charge North Carolina and Connecticut taxes if the buyer is in North Carolina or in Connecticut. If the buyer is outside of those states and he doesn't have any locations in those states, then there's no tax. And that's how um, the people get the idea that it's tax free. Um, but it's, it's definitely not. You have to spend a lot of time learning. Um, this is how taxes make me feel. <laughs> when I was dealing with the North Carolina and the Connecticut, I found that North Carolina isn't just a flat sales tax like Connecticut is. They have county and city sales taxes. Um, so depending on where the county is, it was, you know, the, I, if her, it was 7.2% sales tax for the whole state, and then it was like 0.3 sales tax for one county and 0.4 sales tax for another county. And now you're talking about dealing with uh, zip codes and trying to figure out which, which zip code is in which county and um, what the percentage is for those counties and how to calculate it. And it's, it's not fun. Um, Isn't there a plugin for that? <laughs> okay, this question was actually asked to me last time. Um, I did this talk and I did a little bit of research because in my experience I have not found a plugin. Um, but what I did find is there's services for it. Uh, ta they actually, it's almost like outsourcing your tax <coughs> management. Um, there's either, you can do it one of two ways. You can actually outsource the whole tax management where you filter in that checkout point um, and it does it has the service that you pay has all of the up-to-date tax information and, and will kind of calculate it for you and send it back to you in a way that you can present it to the client. Um, and then the, the good thing about those services is it's not just sending you the, the cost information for the client, but you can also check in and see which taxes you owe to which place because calculating them is one part. The second part is tracking them because you need to then turn the sales tax over to the town or the city or the state that we're collected in. Um, so if you're just using your normal e-commerce to deal with those, then you have to make sure that your client is aware that you know this state has this accounting issue so that they can either track it themselves or the client will expect some kind of tracking for them where they can log into their admin and say, I paid out this much to this state um, which those exist, those plugins to see how much um, or how much you've collected to, for each state exist, but not on the county or city level. Um, and, and that's why those uh, those services work really well. Um, it's it's extremely important to just really look into uh, talk to an accountant. Um, I'm not an accountant, so I can't really give you tax advice, but. Um, an accountant could really give you that idea, make sure it's somebody that's in that state, because state sales tax is way more complicated than I had ever thought it was when I first jumped into this. Um, Connecticut is very straightforward. 
there's a great API called Avalara. I was about to get to that. <laughs> yep, Avalara. There's um, I have my list. Uh, Taxware and ZipTax.com. Uh, ZipTax I found is the most affordable one. Um, it's just an API, so that'll actually send you um, send you just the cost that you have to uh, charge based on the zip code um, of the person. I hadn't found those out until recently, actually, and I was very excited when I found them because oh, it was huge. Huge, 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 huge headache. Um, you have five minutes. Perfect, because I'm just at the end. Um, so just to overview, uh, we've got our customers and we've got our orders. Those are the two back-end pieces that are relatively simple and straightforward. Customer is a data piece very similar to the way content managed piece would be, and orders are the same thing. It's just a a uh, record in the database of which what was ordered and when. Um, it's really the stuff that I had gone over previously, which is the products, the variables, the shipping. All of that stuff is what you really need to focus on, and unfortunately it's one of the things that are missed. Um, so does anybody have any questions? What plugins do you use for WordPress? I use WooCommerce is my go-to WordPress uh, e-commerce plugin. It's very kind of cleanly coded, it's very open, the community is pretty pretty established and well set. I've been keeping my eye on Market Press, um, which is a, I'd say, relatively new, I think it's four years old, um, maybe less. Uh, Market Press is pretty good, but it doesn't have all of the features that I need in regards to um, like product variables, uh, but they have kind of a roadmap that shows that stuff coming maybe in the future, so I've been keeping an eye on it. But I use WooCommerce, or if it's really basic, you know, you can kind of build out your own catalog. Um, I, I use Pods a lot, is kind of my go-to thing. It's an extension for WordPress that lets you kind of just create uh, content-managed blocks. Um, and I want to say it's like a custom, it's, an, it's like a custom post type generator with a UI, but it also allows you to create um, data that's separate from the post table. So I like to use that because uh, the one issue that I have with WordPress as an e-commerce is that it stores products, orders, and customers all in the posts table. And I know it's not an issue like on the front end, they never see it, but to me I like to have my products separate from the posts. Um, so Pods actually allows you to do that. It's called the Pods Framework. Yep. Are there any plugins you recommend if you just want to be an affiliate, you want to sell other people's products and you don't need shipping and inventory and tax and all that? Um, you still need some kind of, well, if you're selling other people's products, you're not taking money, you're just referring them to the website, or are you taking money for those? Because there's two ways to do it. You don't take it directly, that's a good point. If you're getting paid, if you're taking the money directly, if you're kind of, that's almost like a drop shipper situation, where you're taking the money and then you're sending the order to the, the seller and then they're shipping it out, you still have to do this the shipping and the taxes and all of that stuff. If it's an affiliate where you're listing products and you're linking to the product's website, Pods is perfect for that because you don't need any e-commerce. You can just create like a custom post type. Okay, I'm sorry, what, what is the Pods. P-O-D-S. P -O -D -S. Pods framework. Yeah. Have you ever had to deal with products that aren't like t-shirts or... Um, something that diminishes, like for instance, uh, reams of fabric. So rather than selling, so you can sell half a yard to one person, three yards to another person, in terms of keeping up with inventory. It's still very it. similar. If you're going to do it, you, you want to kind of figure out, you really do the inventory by the smallest metric that you're going to sell, basically. Um, I think I lost my mic. So. Um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to diminish it to the smallest amount. So you can put on the front end one yard, two yards, half foot. But on the back end, you want to make sure that one yard equals 36 inches, whatever. You wanna, if you're selling it by the inch. So, how about if your product. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> how about if what you're selling is um, service instead of product? You just want to sell blocks of time. Selling or, service is really easy, a lot easier actually. I don't um, think so. You don't have to ship it. No shipping, no taxes. You have to show up. There's, uh, well, in most cases, there's no taxes either. Um, I think in Connecticut, as far as I know, like one of the only or taxable services photography. Um, and that, that, gets, that gets funky. Um, but yeah, 
there, it's much easier. You can really just do a straight up e-commerce. Like I said, like with fabric, you would kind of bring it down to the lowest increment of time. So if you're going to do about a 15 minutes, about a half hour, um, that way you can actually calculate your time and not oversell your time for a week. You can limit how much you know people can can buy from you. Is there a, something already set that you can plug into that would? Where you would sell your time and do scheduling. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a plugin. There's a couple of, like booking plugins. Even if you're doing a service, something like a booking plugin, like a hotel reservation plugin would work. Um, there's an events manager plugin that allows you to sell like like chunks of time or, or event. Like you can set up actual like events to sell that time, kind of too. But a booking manager, like a fitness kind of booking, or uh, I think there's a spa one. That would work. I mean, you just kind of have to re rework it. But yeah. Hi, I have a question. Oh, oh, we got two people with the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, is the it, uh, when you're talking about these methods, are there a plugin certain? Are, are the plugins um, geared towards one method or the other, or is it a comp? You know, can you just choose? A, are there certain plugins that are more geared towards these different methods? Because I assume you're just the product, all these. Yeah, the product um, methods. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, WooCommerce is the one that I use that kind of works for all of the different methods. Um, some of the plugins don't deal with variables at all. They won't deal with uh, inventory on variables or shipping on variables. So you really want to kind of pay attention to that. Um, but WooCommerce is usually my go-to for or more complex. Do you want to ask real quick? I'll, I'll wait. I'll just okay. Afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to come up and ask me. I'll I'll sit in the back of the room so the other people can get set up. Okay.